Go to jcm-1.com and get cool stuff! Everything else is done. Now it's time to put color on the screen. Warm up the CRT, it's time for another episode. In previous videos, we built NTSC-compatible composite video timing. Now it's time to put color on the screen. So today, we'll be constructing a basic pixel generator and the associated analog circuits to make that happen. Much of the design used here is informed by the Lazarus 64 project by Lucid Science. Link in the description. In addition, the format of this video is a little bit different. The complexity of this part of the circuit made it awkward to build on camera. Trust me, I tried six times. So we'll be showing it pre-built. Let's dig in. Here are the major components. The color phase generator. This determines what color a pixel should be. The pixel pusher. A rudimentary frame buffer for the sake of demonstration that generates and sends pixel data to the screen. The digital to analog converter. The final circuit that mixes all of the signals together to produce an image. Here are the components we'll need to build it. Let's talk about color first. To understand how that works, we'll review how the TV draws to the screen. If you look closely at the color TV tube, you'll see that it's separated into bands of red, green, and blue phosphors. Although not exactly correct, you can imagine that these are spaced across the screen, so as the electron beam traces across, each triplet is illuminated for 279.36 nanoseconds, or exactly one cycle of 3.58 megahertz. So, suppose we superimpose a 3.58 MHz signal onto the video signal. Wherever the peak of that signal is, in relation to where the electron beam is tracing across those phosphors, that's the color that will show on the screen. I'll reiterate that this is a pedestrian view and not remotely correct, but it works to help you wrap your head around the process. To make colors, we can feed the 3.58 MHz color reference into a circuit that can delay the signal in time so that the peak rests on the color we want. This is called phase shifting. A simple way to do that is with a string of buffers. A buffer takes an input and pushes it to an output, bringing the signal back up to normal levels. However, it has a phenomenon called propagation delay that we will exploit. This is the delay between when the signal is received and when the semiconductor can saturate enough to turn on the output. If we use buffers with a known propagation delay, we can select outputs to fit the phases we need. This is what I've done by cross-connecting five 74LS245 octal buffers to get different phase values. Each buffer has a typical propagation delay at 5 volts of 7 nanoseconds. With 279.36 nanoseconds in a 3.58 MHz cycle, we need about 40 buffers to cover 360 degrees of phase. So if we use five chips, we can select values to get hues evenly spread across the color spectrum. Note that you can use 74HC245 buffers for reduction in current draw. However, the HC part has a different response curve on fall times than on rise times. I found that using the HC part causes colors at the end of the chain to wash out. Let's take a look at the circuit. Here, you can see all of the buffers chained together. The first buffer receives the 3.58 MHz color reference signal and passes it on down the chain. In addition, the buffers are all connected to pixel enable. This ensures that they can only output a signal during the active video period. And finally, at the bottom, you can see the evenly spaced taps chosen to give colors across the entire spectrum. Now, let's look at the pixel pusher. The Pixel Data Generator, or Pixel Pusher as I call it, is a simple circuit that generates a sequential 8-bit number on every pixel clock. This was put together for ease of demonstration and building. This circuit is very simple. It's another of our favorite 74HC4040 timers with pixel clock as the counter's clock and not pixel enable tied to the counter's reset. It counts from 0 through 251, then resets at the end of each line. This simulates a true pixel generator that is fetching byte values from memory and presenting them to the rest of the circuit. Now that we are generating a byte every pixel clock, we need to know what to do with it. What do each of these bytes mean and how do we make a picture with it? In this design, I have separated the bytes in half, where the lowest four bits are used for color information, called chroma, and the highest four bits are used for brightness information, called luma. 
This gives us 16 hues times 16 brightness values, or 256 distinct color values. So, how does this all tie together? Let's look at color first. First, I take 16 evenly spaced taps from the color phase generator and feed those into two 74HC4051 8-channel multiplexers. Those multiplexers then receive the low 4 bits of the pixel value from the pixel pusher. Depending on which bit value goes into the multiplexer, a particular phase value will be chosen from the color phase generator to be routed to the output, which puts that color on the screen. Now there are two important details on how this functions. First, since the multiplexers are 8 channel, but I'm feeding them 16 values, we need to ensure that the top bit is used as the enable line. So I use an inverter here. The first multiplexer gets the top bit value directly. The second one gets it from the inverter. Second, you'll notice one of the inputs is tied directly to ground. This allows us to have black, grays, and white in our color palette. At the end, both multiplexers' outputs are tied together and sent out. Finally, the digital to analog converter. Now we need to tackle brightness. For this, we use a contraption called an R2R DAC, short for Resistor to Resistor Digital to Analog Converter. Using the concept of a resistive voltage divider, we create a DAC with four inputs. The binary input directly dictates the voltage that comes out in 16 discrete steps. So we feed this the high four bits of our pixel generator, and we get brightness. This signal is called LUMA. This is built using 200 ohm and 100 ohm resistors in the following manner. Finally, to mix all our color signals together. This is fully within the analog domain with applications of Ohm's law, capacitive coupling, and other general electron theory skullduggery. Here it is step by step. LUMA is fed out through a 180 ohm resistor and goes directly to the final output. Combined with the 75 ohm resistance of the TV and all the other circuit resistances, this provides the right peak white voltage of around 1 volt. Chroma is fed through a 560 ohm resistor, then coupled onto the output with a 100 picofarad capacitor. The resistor works in concert with the other resistor values to reduce the maximum voltage the chroma signal can produce to keep it within the specification. The capacitor ensures the chroma signal is centered on the LUMA voltage. Composite sync is passed through a 100 ohm resistor, then directly to the output. Again, the resistor limits the maximum voltage. Color burst is passed through a 3300 ohm resistor and then coupled with a 100 nanofarad capacitor into the same point as composite sync. Again, the resistor is chosen to keep the value within the spec, and the capacitor ensures it's centered on the midpoint of the signal voltage. The final output is our generated video signal. Now let's play around a bit and see what this circuit can do. If we disconnect the chroma output, we'll see the shades of gray the circuit can create. If we disconnect the LUMA output, we'll see a barely visible selection of color values. If we bypass the multiplexer, we can choose to output only a particular hue. This rich orange is one of my favorites. And with that, we have an NTSC signal generator using Jelly Bean Logic. As it is, you can use it as a pattern generator to test televisions to ensure they work. But, if you create a proper pixel data generator, you can feed it pixels from a computer and make a television display. That's my final end goal. Thanks for watching! Remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on my latest adventures. You can also support me through Patreon or by snagging some merch. Links in the description. Well, that's all for today's episode. While you're here, check out some other videos, and remember, 8 bits are all you need. Color Burst is passed through a 330 ohm resistor, then coupled with a 100 nanofarad cabat. Blah, 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 blah. This is a hard, this one's hard to say.